Hello all and welcome. The following talk focuses on the vulnerability of electronic devices to electromagnetic interference with regard to IT security. With the subject of EMP threats getting more and more traction nowadays, security specialists Shoki Kasmi and Jose Lopez Estevez will explain and classify the types of attacks that we are exposed to. They both have extensive experience in security research, having worked at the French National Cybersecurity Agency, Shoki has a PhD in electronics and has recently joined the TV labs at Dark Matter LLC. Join me in welcoming them on stage. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Hello. Thank you for joining us. So we are Shoki Kasmi and José López Estevez here. Um, we are very happy to be here today to talk about EM threats for information security and how we may find ways to induce chaos in digital and analog electronic devices thanks to directed energy weapons. So we are both uh, electromagnetic security experts. Uh, we do also radio communication security analysis, um, some hardware and uh, embedded system uh, security research as well as signal processing. A quick disclaimer, because I recently joined Dark Murder LLC in UAE, um, so the research was done during my uh, research activities at the French Network Information Security Agency, and all the content that will be presented today was done uh, during those research activities. Um, I'm grateful for the support and encouragement provided by Dark Murder in allowing me to present this research today with my uh, colleague, uh, José López Estevez. So, the agenda for today, um, we will introduce you the topic of electromagnetic security, then to present you why we are looking for effects induced by EM waves. Um, then we will have a look at EM vulnerability of some devices and how we may uh, involve those effects and turning them into um, information security issues. And at the end of the talk, we will draw some conclusions and perspective of concerning our research. So let's start with electromagnetic security. So you may have uh, all seen those nice movies, so Hollywood movies, where um, they are using some EMP weapons to disable electronic and uh, electric devices, like, or any um, facilities, using those EMP weapons. So even Batman has an EMP weapon in movies. So basically, it's for common people, EMP weapons are a fantasy weapon. But since the 90s, many countries have developed capabilities in order to involve EMP weapons in order to induce um, perturbation into targeted devices, as well as to try to damage them thanks to high power uh, sources. So those sources are involving the same effect as high altitude electromagnetic uh, uh, waves generated by nuclear pulses, um, and those high intensity fields induce parasitic currents and voltages into targeted devices. And all those parasitic currents and voltages um, induce perturbations on communication devices as well as any digital uh, data link. So the effects vary uh, from very uh, low level effects, so basic disturbances, um, and can reach also um, permanent damages on devices. So, what we are looking for, basically, is to be able to detect and analyze the effects induced uh, by the sources during parasitic exposure, so that we are able to design appropriate protections and to harden critical facilities. One important point is basically to link the hardware um, errors to software failures, so that we are able to understand how electronic devices react 
um, during parasitic exposure, as well as the wool infrastructures in which, in which we will place them. And from that, we are also able to understand if there are any cascading effects. So basically, if we target one system, what kind of effect we may induce on over-connected devices. So as we said, it's not a fantasy weapon. A couple of uh, events occurred in Europe, and Frank Sabat um, presented a brief summary of what happens in Europe and other countries. So it starts from very simple RF uh, sources, so RF guns used by some uh, malicious, uh, during malicious activities to uh, trigger uh, winning at a game machine in Japan. Um, then we have some uh, use of EM disruptor to uh, neutralize security systems of critical infrastructures on specific places like jewelry, um, recent, uh, some recent security systems um, during, so that were disabled during parasitic exposure, as well as some bank in UK and Netherlands. So this summary is interesting because it defines a couple of, of events in which some sources with high mobility or low mobility have been used in order to disrupt some targeted devices. In the same way, we are able to understand that those devices um, does not require um, very high knowledge or skills to be able to design them. This is the last column of this uh, table. And we can see that basically, if someone is interested by building some sources, a couple of information are readily available on the internet. So, um, the use of electromagnetic interference to disable or disturb electronic devices is directly linked to the topic of electromagnetic compatibility, in which we defined some uh, general standards to test equipment and check that they will not uh, experience any um, abnormal behavior when they are exposed in the normal electromagnetic environment. So this is the topic of immunity testing. In the same way, we try to limit the emanations of any electric and electronic device in the environment um, by reducing the EM noise gener generated by those devices. So, as you may imagine, as we apply basic standards, it's a world of trust and compliance. We test those devices as the laptop here, and we try to have the best, uh, the, the, the best compliance of those, this device to the, so that it can be used in a in uh, any place where it sh should be used. In the same way, um, some information security guys have been working on those uh, topics and have seen that basically we can find some correlation between the process data and the emanation of those devices. This, called, this topic is called Tempest, and there is also the side channel uh, area in which we correlate the activity of a chip or a system with the data processed by this device. In the same way, some researchers are working on fault injection on the smart cars and, uh, and FPGAs. So it's using basically um, the near field interaction between the source and the target so that we are able to extract some keys um, or any interesting uh, secrets on the device. So in this way, we see that basically we go beyond the standards applied in, EM, in the EMC area. We don't uh, stay, uh, we don't comply with the standards because we, have a, we are looking at very small correlations or susceptibility level that may be used to, um, to, 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 to reduce the security of those devices. So it's a, a world of deception. So as a, as a risk uh, for uh, information security, uh, it's basically um, a phenomena uh, that originated from the EMC. So it's a physical phenomena. And in the same way, targeting, targeting information systems uh, based on electronic device is highly useful when we are looking at the security of, the, of, the, of these devices. So 
The threads are as, as, uh, as defined in the previous slide. So we have the emanation threads, which, might, which uh, introduce uh, threads for the, confi the confidentiality of uh, the information, as we are able to recover data from the emanations of the electronic devices. And in the same way, the integrity and the availability of the device is directly linked to the immunity of this device to parasitic fields. So our challenges are the two, uh, these two ones. The first is how can we assess the vulnerability of any electronic device to parasitic exposure? And if we want to do some risk management, we need to be able to rate any EM attack against any device. So concerning the vulnerability testing of electronic devices, so let's have a look at the complexity on how we, we, how we would like to be able to test devices. So we have complex systems with a lot of uh, uh, different kind of material and uh, communication uh, links. Um, we have wired or wireless connections between devices. And we have a lot of undeterministic interaction between the devices. As we are using some specific protocols, and at the time we are injecting waves, uh, we need to be able to reproduce this, uh, this uh, test setup. We have a problem of scales, because we may want to analyze the security of a chip, as well as to be able to analyze the security of a wool building. And this makes a lot of, um, a lot of uh, random parameters appearing to analyze the different attack scenarios uh, with different payloads. The issue of modeling, as we cannot model a full infrastructure, uh, of, um, a, a, a huge building with, with very small electronic device in there due to uh, modeling issues. Um, and it requires a lot of scientific fields to be, uh, to be used in order to be able to model and to analyze the coupling of waves into those buildings. So, as we just said, there are a lot of random parameters, and if we want to understand and to be able to predict any uh, vulnerability of the device, we need to do some exhaustive testing. But the problem with exhaustivity is that it requires a lot of co uh, random configuration so that for specific parameters, we are able to reproduce any configuration we would like to work on. And this makes some issues with the reproducibility and the generalization of the results. So from a reduced number of configuration, we would like to be able to understand the, wool, the, the behavior of the device for the wool um, conf the whole set of config possible configurations. And in the same way, when we want to uh, analyze the effect on a complex system, the detection of the, of, the, of the effect is complex itself. So as information security researchers, um, what we would like to be able is to have uh, the ability to rate any kind of EM attack against a specific device. So, the electromagnetic instrumentation uh, require, um, like the used source to disturb or to uh, induce failure on any, any electronic devices um, can be characterized by those three parameters. So, the viability of the device and its costs, cost. Is it possible to find it uh, on internet, or do I, I to, do I have to, to have a look at specific um, tutorials to be able to, to, to design it? Um, the dimension of the source, can I put it in my bag or in a car? So this defines the mobility of the source. And the capabilities. So do I have the possibility to tune the source for specific frequencies? Um, can I modify the amplitude of my source? And those parameters are very important to understand how they can be used to defeat specific electronic devices. So for that, it requires a lot of technical knowledge. Maybe, maybe not. 
after looking at the internet, we have seen that there are a lot of resources for that. Um, the effective range of the source, do I have to be close to my target or can I stay a bit far from it? Uh, do I need some information about my target? Do I have to test it before being able to do it in real uh, scenarios? Can I industrialize my source? So once I have designed my source, can I sell it? Or, um, and is it target specific? Do I have to design a source for each target I, will, I, I may have to work on? So for looking at this problem, there are two ways. The first is starting from the source itself. So I have my source. Um, it can be uh, connected to an antenna or an injection probe. So then we are in two propagation mode, the radiation in the free space, or do I inject my waves in, in cables? Then I am in the conducted one. We have also the link between both of them. We have the coupling to the target. Is it a front door coupling? So am I targeting a wireless interface of my target? Or is it a backdoor coupling phenomena? I am inducing my waves into some conductive part in the, in the system. And I have my effects, which is the last part of my propagation chain. If I start from the source, then I will define specific scenarios for a specific devices. But if I start from my target and I check effects in a very general environment, then I might be able to, to check all the parameters that I may experience when I want to harden a critical infrastructure. So we have chosen the second way of, have, of having a look at this problem, and we have been working on the effects induced by parasitic field on electronic devices. OK. so. Um now I am going to uh, introduce the, our strategy for uh, uh, the, analyze, the analysis of uh, effects on specific targets. So we will see that it's not a trivial problem and uh, I will present uh, the decisions, the choices that we have made to uh, ad address this issue. Uh, so here we are uh, um, trying to observe uh, the effects of uh, the uh, presence of electromagnetic uh, parasitic signals uh, around the, the, the target. And for that, the, the game generally is always the same, uh, whatever the field, uh, the scientific field, you, you send the stimuli, so uh, it's our parasitic field, and uh, you want to observe changes on the target uh, that will respond to your stimuli, and uh, you want to correlate the, the stimuli and the changes. And uh, the, the challenges here are uh, that, as uh, Shauki introduced, uh, because of the, the complexity of the problem, uh, there are a lot of um, different kinds of stimuli that we can uh, uh, send to the target. Uh, we can also um, use um, um, addition, additions of uh, different stimulations. And um, the second problem is that we have to determine what to look at uh, to decide that there is an effect on the target or not. So, in fact, the, one of the main challenges in that game is to design the right classes to see the effects of the electromagnetic uh, stimulations. So that's what we, we proposed, that's what we did. Um, and we propose a... a well, usually, uh, you want to identify the critical functions of the system you want to monitor. So it's uh, kind of the, the health uh, parameters of uh, your system. And um, then you have to find a way to monitor uh, those critical functions and maybe define some metrics to then compare or uh, classify uh, the different uh, uh, effects that you observed uh, on those observables. So sometimes it can be easy. Uh, if you think about a, a rotating robotic arm, maybe you can just say, OK, it still works, or it doesn't work anymore. And when it doesn't work anymore, you say, I have an effect. Uh, but you also uh, sometimes need to have a, more f f a finer granularity in your uh, metrics. 
so for the rotating robotic arm, you can think about the, the positioning error uh, of your arm. Uh, so you will have to find a way to measure that and then monitor that during the tests uh, to determine then if uh, there was an effect, if that effect was really correlated to your stimuli in order to analyze uh, the, the vulnerability of your system. So we adopted a, a generic approach. We thought, OK, uh, instead of adapting our approach to the uh, specific context, uh, we thought about uh, a generic approach which is uh, system-centric. So our idea was to uh, try to analyze the effect uh, as the operating system uh, can see them. And it's interface-based, so as uh, introduced by Shaoqi, there are different types of coupling on the device, and um, we enumerated the interfaces uh, for the physical coupling that are available on the device, and um, we found a way to um, have access to some information coming from those interfaces uh, at the operating system level. And in the end, we have a, a software that is running on the operating system and that is monitoring the different interfaces uh, looking for effects, in fact. And what's interesting with that strategy is that we, uh, we don't really uh, need to uh, understand the propagation of the physical effects uh, through to the software effects. In fact, we, we try to have an observation of the software layer level effects during the tests. And as for the vast variety of different stimuli that uh, an attacker could use, we decided to uh, consider the, the lowest attacker profile so uh, low-cost source, uh, low-bandwidth uh, source. So uh, we basically use a, a software-defined radio with uh, uh, several am amplifiers. And uh, the, um, the physical uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, waves that we um, uh, send to the target uh, are uh, what we call RF pulses. So it's a low profile, uh, a low attacker profile. And we have two setups that are depicted here. On the left, uh, we have our uh, radiated propagation uh, setup. So uh, it's in a Faraday cage. We have our targets uh, running the monitoring software that we designed. And uh, we have uh, an antenna inside the, the Faraday cage, which uh, will send the stimuli. And outside the cage, we have uh, a monitoring computer, which will um, gather the information uh, collected by the monitoring software and uh, our uh, RF sources instrumentation. And on the right, we have the equivalent uh, setup for the conducted uh, propagation. So uh, once we define the test uh, scenario and test configuration, we put a couple of devices in the Faraday cage. And now we will show you some uh, effects induced by para during parasitic exposure and by understanding how we were able to correlate the effects to the parasitic field we have found a way to involve uh, EM wave for uh, as a new technique to inject data into devices or to interact with devices and we will show you how we did it so just for be uh, so the, at the beginning we used some general computers and we monitored some common APIs and uh, even logs uh, on uh, the computer, and we send our uh, parasitic signal to the target. So here we have a couple of logs. Uh, you don't need to read them because we summarized them for you. And we have seen here, for example, the two uh, uh, keyboard links we were testing, so the PS2 and the USB. Um, and we have seen some, so we were able to get those effects. So we were able to corrupt data 
that was received by the computer, um, and to randomly inject valid case struct on the computer. On the USB, we have been able to disable the hub, uh, disconnect uh, devices, peripherals that were connected to the computer, and also to corrupt the script or so. This is backdoor coupling effect, because we were targeting a data link which are not intended to collect energy. Then we wanted to test some SCADA systems, or so like industrial control system. Um, we put a server motor in a Faraday cage, and we tested some the behavior of the of the server motor when it was running, running a specific uh, path. So the normal behavior of the device is the blue one. Um, now I will try to show it to you here. Okay, here you see the blue uh, the blue, which is a normal the normal behavior device, and in green and orange we send it our pulses. And we can see here that the, we have been able to modify the position of the, of the servo motor, as well as the speed of it. So we were able to randomly manipulate the servo motor using our error pulses. Then we worked on uh, some digital uh, pre-processing uh, uh, algorithm. Uh, here it is the, um, the pre-distortion algorithm uh, running on an FPGA. The pre-distortion algorithm is used to compensate the power amplifier distortion where we are using it in the non-linear region. So we compute the non, we predict the non-linearities of the power amplifier, which is t minus one, and the actual distortion induced by the power amplifier is 2. So if you do 10 minus 1 by t, you have 1. But in the same way, if you're injecting some RF pulses during the computation of the, di the distortion uh, by, uh, induced by the amplifier, so here it's the G, J for jamming, we were able to modify the behavior of the pre-distortion algorithm. And by modifying this behavior here, it's the, um, this curve here, in uh, black. We see here that we have some elevation of the side lobe of the source. So it means that we are jamming uh, all devices that are collocated to the radio frequency. Uh, so, for example, the mobile station uh, around this, the targeted one. So we were able to, to modify the packets emitted by the, by the, by the mobile station. Then it sends um, uh, data with a, a high bit error rate. So any device that received the signal received corrupted data. And on the right, in the same way as we increase the side lobes, all the devices that communicate around this cell with other cells, uh, if they are using uh, the uh, frequency band near the, the targeted one, then we are able to stop the communication on this level. So this is the cascading effect we have been talking about. Yeah, another interesting point in that example is that uh, the, the computation of the pre-distortion uh, factors uh, is not uh, performed usually uh, uh, every second. I mean, it's uh, more at the scale of the minute. So in fact, with uh, just one uh, malicious intervention, uh, you can uh, um, you can make the, the, the radio front-end uh, self-jam itself uh, during several minutes until the recomputation of the pre-distortion uh, uh, factors. We also uh, instrumented uh, analog interfaces, uh, and uh, we are going here to present the results we had on uh, thermal transducer and also on uh, acoustic uh, transducers, uh, microphones. So uh, there, are, uh, there is some literature about the, uh, from the EMC community about the susceptibility of uh, analog circuits. And uh, it's admitted now that uh, uh, some analog uh, circuits um, do some uh, envelope detection. So it's a kind of uh, amplitude demodulation uh, of the parasitic signal. And um, uh, especially uh, for... Um, 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 
operational op amplifiers. Uh, there is also a, a an offset that is added to the signal uh, yeah, when uh, a parasitic field is uh, present on the target. And also, um, as it, uh, we are talking about uh, analog interfaces, uh, they are usually uh, end up on uh, ADCs. So all the work that, wa that has been made about the vulnerability of uh, analog to digital converters uh, can also be used uh, in that case. So during our tests, we have been monitoring the uh, behavior of the, the thermistor, the thermal diode of the CPU of our target. And we noticed that uh, when our uh, uh, parasitic field was on, uh, we saw that uh, the temperature that was reported by the diode uh, was kind of erratic. So uh, how can it be used by an attacker? Um, we tried to derive a scenario uh, exploiting that uh, uh, factor. And uh, we ran additional tests, and we noticed that uh, the temperature that was reported by the, the thermal diode uh, was um, um, kind of um, homothetic to the electric field magnitude, the parasitic electric field uh, magnitude. Um, so that means that uh, the attacker w is able to uh, finally control the behavior of the, the temperature reading uh, on the target. So we imagine the scenario where uh, an attacker uses that to uh, send information to a malicious uh, process that is uh, monitoring continuously the temperature on the target. And, uh, in some cases, I mean, in uh, cases where you have, for example, uh, put an air gap strategy in place in order to separate uh, uh, several uh, information systems of heterogeneous criticity, uh, this kind of threat uh, can be uh, serious. And also, of course, if I can, uh, if an attacker is able to control the temperature that is uh, uh, transmitted from the, the diode to uh, the uh, CPU or a reader of the temperature, uh, one can easily think about uh, sabotage uh, scenarios. During our tests, we also monitored the, um, the audio front end. So we basically just recorded the audio uh, coming from the, the audio card. Uh, and uh, we, we, d we made that uh, with a microphone uh, on, with a microphone, uh, with a wired microphone uh, plugged in, or uh, without microphone. And uh, we always uh, have been able to notice that uh, um, there were some effects of the presence of the parasitic field. And again, we tried to imagine scenarios where this could be a a threat for information uh, security on a system. And uh, fr from that observation, we several works uh, were derived. And we considered that uh, the analog microphone is uh, usually a, a user interface that gives access to uh, the voice assistance uh, interfaces. Uh, and we designed uh, several proofs of concept uh, exploiting this um, way to interact with the, the system uh, in order to execute uh, arbitrary voice commands on uh, the target. We did two proof of concepts. On the right, you see the radiated one. So in that case, um, the, the coupling interface was the, the headphones cable. And uh, we also uh, uh, performed additional tests uh, and uh, designed a test to, see the, to test the, the conducted uh, propagation path. And uh, we were able to inject uh, voice commands by injecting the parasitic signal inside the power network uh, when the phone was uh, charging. So uh, this research has been published uh, at Hacking Paris, 
but we have still the two uh, quick uh, videos uh, to about those uh, those tests. So I need to recover my mouse. Okay. So in this video is the the radiated uh, test setup. We have uh, we are in the Faraday cage. Uh, our target is the smartphone, and uh, we can see the the headphone cable on the left uh, side of the screen, and of course uh, our uh, antenna uh, that is uh, sending the the parasitic uh, signal. And we can notice that uh, there is some activity on the audio front end because the 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 dot the red dot uh, on the the upper right uh, corner of the the phone screen. And in, in that example, we sent a long uh, voice command uh, asking to open uh, a website. And at that time, on, on that, that uh, Android version, uh, there was no real feedback to the user, and uh, the, the website was open without any other interaction with the target. And the, the conducted case, so here, we, you see how our setup, so we have the power supply with the computer uh, plugged in, and here we have an injection probe with uh, this cable going to our uh, radio frequency source. And our target is here on the, the desk and uh, is plugged to the, the power socket uh, with a, a genuine charger. And in that case, we, we just ask to open uh, an application. So if you need more information about uh, uh, technical details on those uh, proofs of concepts. Uh, you can refer to the talks we made uh, in Hack in Paris, and we also released the uh, IEEE papers. And uh, here we just tried to uh, imagine uh, to perform a quick risk analysis about uh, those kind of uh, vulnerabilities. And uh, of course, uh, the anything you you can do by using the voice command interface can be done using those techniques. What's also interesting is that we completed the, 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 the study by trying uh, both uh, front door and back door coupling scenarios. Uh, we also did the radiated testing and the conducted testing. And uh, we tried to estimate the, the attacker profile and the, 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 require the power uh, and the, the equipment that is required to perform those uh, kinds of uh, attacks. And of course, these attacks are uh, uh, highly targeted attacks because uh, the attacker needs to uh, uh, change the, at least the, the waveform, the parasitic waveform, uh, to adapt himself to the, the, the situation, the target, the phone, for example, or the uh, power network specificities. OK, so. We just some additional details about the injection voice command injection techniques. Um, concerning the second one, we have seen that it's a USB cable that is targeted. Targeted. Um, we have connected this USB cable to the computer also, and we have seen that the signals was going through the power network and the grounding of the of the computer, and was reaching through the USB uh, shield the microphone IC. So this is interesting because it is uh, some known issues from the EMC community. So the crosstalk between the USB port and the microphone IC. But from the information security point of view, we, have, we didn't have seen any study that was showing that we were able to inject uh, defined signals on this voice command interface. Um, Thanks to all those tests, we have, so we have been able to analyze, uh, to detect and analyze the effects induced by 
IMI, so intentional electromagnetic interferences um, during parasitic exposure. Um, we have been able to classify the effects, so defining the criticality of each effect with regards of the application. Um, we have been able to estimate the impact for the security of the, device, the tested devices, uh, and all those information contributes to uh, the information security risk analysis and to help us to put some additional uh, protective devices so that IMI cannot be involved to perform those kind of uh, attacks against electronic devices. And more generally, uh, we um, observed that the electromagnetic, electromagnetic attacks are uh, a kind of a realistic threat, uh, even if uh, generally, if you want to perform more than a, a denial of service attack, uh, it will be a targeted attack because you will need to, uh, to um, adapt your attack setup to uh, your, your target and to the, the context around the target. We also wanted to emphasize that uh, the attacker profile uh, for this kind of attacks is uh, getting lower and lower uh, because of uh, technological evolutions. Uh, the uh, devices that are needed to uh, create some of the re required uh, sources uh, is uh, more and more affordable and av available, freely available to, to anyone uh, on the internet. Uh, and it's the, we, we can say the same of on the, the power amplifiers, for example. And uh, one last uh, word to try to join people to this kind of research. Um, we noticed that uh, the AMC community, the uh, information security community, and uh, the specific uh, uh, physical cryptanalysis and uh, side channel uh, and photo attacks uh, communities uh, worked um, on their own path, uh, but in reality we are look looking at the same problem and uh, just we have different points of view and different uh, objectives. So uh, maybe it's time to uh, join together and uh, try to uh, share the resources and the knowledge about the, these issues. So we thank you very much for your attention. As usual, you have all the re references that we use to, to create this talk and our uh, email addresses if you have any questions or if you want to interact about those topics, uh, we will be happy to do so. Thank you. So step up to the microphones and we also take questions online. We have a signal angel monitoring the question feed. Anybody? Microphone two, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for the interesting topic. Um, I saw your uh, lab equipment and you didn't screen the charge or any cables. Why or um, the, maybe another question, did you test this with screening of the cables and how much uh, is affected uh, or um, yeah, the, the cable in the results? Uh, on those uh, re research topics, we did not really. Uh, we tested several USB cables and te several uh, uh, genuine chargers. I mean, uh, cuts out of the box uh, chargers, and we observed that uh, the we were able to on the the audio frequency band, we were able to recover our signal. The fr the frequency response was kind of flat, so uh, it didn't really affect uh, the effect on the target. Thank you. Um, microphone number one. Yep. Thank you for the talk. Um, this was all very new to me, so I'm very, very scared right now. Um, because I am learning how to fly small aircraft, and a lot of it is, there's a lot of communication that happens via radio. Um, and I'm wondering, when you talked about the effective range, um, what kind of threats are we looking at uh, for something, say, 
at a, an altitude of say even 2,000 feet um, and a moving target. So does that make it very, very difficult? Um, I, I'm knowing that um, I don't know much about what you just said, but it was really quite scary. Um, concerning the range, so uh, as we as we presented, we did not uh, work on um, the source side. We directly uh, assessed the effects on the target. If you have any kind of device you would like to work on, basically, you put it in a, um, in a test environment, you check what kind of effect you may expect, depending on the characteristics of the source we have, you have defined. And then defining the range is just using some general uh, theoretical equations that define you the amount of power you need to generate to reach the signal level you need to disrupt your device. Um, for small drones or any, uh, any kind of those devices, we, didn't, we did not specific tests, but yeah, it's an open question and we, we would really happy to work on that if yeah, if I can uh, add uh, something. In your case, I guess uh, you have to estimate the propagation path that we described uh, in the specific conditions that you described, in fact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, microphone two, go ahead. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I have a very small question about the CPU thermistor uh, that you uh, set up and that you can, with RF energy, uh, increase the temperature or the observed temperature of the processor. Uh, was it actually a separate uh, uh, sensor and how long was the cable and what's the output impedance of the sensor? Did you actually check those parameters? Yeah, I think the, it was on, a, on an old motherboard on a computer. The thermistor uh, was uh, interrogated by a super I.O. chip. And I guess the, the dimensions of the, the PCB line between the, the CPU diode and the, the Super IO chip was uh, some, something like 10 centimeters, I guess. Thank you very much. I think we have a question from online. Uh, you've showed us some example of uh, data injection. So this was an active attack. Uh, what about uh, passive ones, like getting the data from the device, for example, pixels of the screen or touch typing of the keyboard? Um, as we, yeah, the, the talk was focused on the, the effects of uh, I intentional electromagnetic interferences. So that's why we didn't talk about the other specific parts of Tempest attacks or side channel attacks. I don't know if that answers the question. Well, thank you for your response. And I think that's all for questions. Oh, no, there's one more from the online feed. Uh, I know that uh, it, 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 this isn't really a topic of your research, but could you give uh, some pointers to recent research on EM emancipation like Tempest attacks? Uh, there was something on AES last year, I guess. Uh, Craig Smith's talk. Uh, the Tempest attacks on AES, it was side channel attack, but with a, a so several feet range, for example, I think it can be a good pointer. Mark, Mark, Marcus Kuhn research at Cambridge University is also a, well, a very good resource to understand the topic of Tempest. Thank you very much, and I think that's it. Let's hear a round of applause for our speakers. Thank you. Thank you.